Yeah, thanks for having me today. And uh, I think I should start by explaining what I do, really. I've been qualified 15 years as a clinical specialist physio. I work for the East Kent NHS Trust. And my job is split into three. I spend a lot of my time teaching and educating patients in groups and individually about why they've got pain and what to do about it. I then travel up and down the country educating groups of clinicians, wide range of clinicians, including chiropractors sometimes, um, about how best to try and manage pain and about the benefits of therapeutic neuroscience education. Uh, the other element that I have is, is an academic role at the University of Brighton as a visiting lecturer and also, um, I don't know whether you have recently published work about metaphors and how metaphors work, so we're, we're going to look a little bit about that today. But I think, when I think about today, I was really pleased to see that the whole day was devoted to communication, because communication is something that I think we intuitively learn, but often we don't talk about it, funnily enough, if you excuse the pun. We, we often tend to look at the more technical skills in our posts. But actually, if we're looking about the management of people, particularly with complex persistent pain, it's the communication that's the big, big part. What we say is often more important than what we do for our patients, and I'll hopefully prove that to you as we go through. What I see in practice is a lot of people who enter into a downward spiral of pain and disability and anxiety and apprehension. And as uncomfortable as this might sound, it's often the words that we use, the language that we use as clinicians that either instigate patients into that spiral or perpetuate it as the years go by. And I, I think that makes a lot of people feel uncomfortable, but it, it is true, the evidence shows it, we'll, we'll look at that. And it's so easy, it's often very unintentional to enter people into that cycle. A lot of the slides that you see today come directly from the group work that we do with patients. And I think there isn't this big distinction between how we educate patients and how we educate clinicians. We're all learners. So we have to start to think like the patients do, and I'm going to try and go through how to do that with you today. So there's quite a bit to get through. I've got 40 minutes to do it. I must say um, the websites are down here at the bottom, and um, as I say, we cover a lot of things in the workshops that we do, which are sometimes two days or four days. So 40 minutes. Here we go. It's going to be a whistle-stop tour. So what is pain? If we start back in 1980, a long time ago, we can see here that Mount Castle thinks that it's a, a, a biomedical thing. It's related to tissue harm. It's related to tissue injury. That's quite some time ago now. The clinical landscape has changed dramatically. Mosley starts to talk about pain being a, a multiple system output activated by the brain based on perceived threat. This is much more a biopsychosocial look. And we've got the lion here approaching the person. It's a perceived threat. Now, if we think about communication, we can either ramp up that threat through the words that we use, or we can reduce that threat. It's simple, really, when we think. But pain is a very, very complex thing. It's not about the tissue. So some historical assumptions about pain. Pain really comes from the Latin word puina, punishment. That might make us understand a little bit about how our patients present. What's their behavior when they come to us with pain? They feel punished. It's not fair. And it comes a lot from this. There's a lot of historical background. This is the Cartesian model. Does anybody know the Cartesian model? Anyone looked at this? Descartes, 16th century, genius French mathematician. Knew what he was talking about back then. But his model doesn't really work. He assumed that the more you put your foot in the fire, the more you're going to get pain. And this makes a really simplistic assumption that pain comes from nociceptive input alone. It's an input. The more I stick my foot in that fire, the more it's going to hurt. And he thought that nerves were hollow tubes and that the, there was a little bell in the brain that set things off. But the problem is that model still drives how we all deliver medicine today, or a lot of us. And this comes back to that landscape change that we've got to start to think about here. OK, so this is the present day reality. And if we can see here, we've got the 16th century Cartesian model in the top left-hand corner, and then we've got our 21st century, much more complex, much more biopsychosocial, pain being both an input and an output, but predominantly based on a lot of different factors that are based here. If we think about this model, we can prove that it doesn't work. If we think one way to try and get this person's pain to stop would be to remove themselves from the fire. Simply take your foot out of the fire, the pain will stop. In persistent pain, that's not the way it works. If you remove yourself from whatever the stimulus is, flexion with back pain, what happens? Huge repercussions. We can't do that. 
So taking people out of things, it's almost the volcano that's going to keep erupting. You know, I hear patients all the time who say, I, I sacrifice things, just like a tribe in a certain parts of the world might sacrifice things, a chicken or something, if the volcano keeps bubbling up to the surface. They're scared of it. They keep coming back. Doing that's not good. The other thing we could do is we could try and douse the fire. We could try and take the flames out. So what do we mean by that? Look at some of these figures. These are from the USA in the last five years. Huge epidemic proportional increases in what we do the biomedical model of what we do for patients, and yet pain rates keep going up. The magic off button has not been found. We need to move away from this model. It's not working for patients or for clinicians. Um, and if we think about epidemics, any epidemic throughout history has been reduced by communication. It's communication that really brings down epidemics. And if we look at pain, simple. If we communicate and we help patients to understand how pain works better, based on a huge raft of current evidence, we can help them. What's the third way? We could cut the wire. Let's chop the wire out of this. That's the surgical approach. Yeah, I work closely with surgeons, and luckily, they're becoming far less scalpel happy. If we think of pain as a perceived threat, how does your brain perceive a scalpel? It's no different from an attack in B&Q on a Saturday. It doesn't work, you know, it's not good. So, surgery is not the answer. Okay. So, if we think that pain is a perception, first of all, we've got to explain perception. So, we have to think about how perception works throughout the senses. So, we're talking about communication today. So, let's talk about hearing. It would be wrong to assume that hearing comes from my ears. We do this with patients and they go, what? You madness. Hearing comes from the brain. What do the ears do? The ears pick up on sound reception, on uh, uh, sound waves. The brain then interprets what happens. So hearing is a perceptual brain construct. Okay, and we're gonna prove that a little bit. I want you to imagine a scenario where you've had a lovely evening out, you've gone out with friends, you come home, and you go upstairs to your bathroom to go to a toilet visit, and you stand on a creaky floorboard. Nothing, fine. What happens now if you stand on that same creaky floorboard another time and you've just watched the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Yeah, we get a very, very different perceived threat response, don't we? Our hearing perception is extremely different in this situation. So let's use that to try and show this to our patients. Now let's move more towards pain and how the nervous system works with pain. What happens, let's think of another example here. We're walking across a road and we sprain our ankle. Yeah, anyone ever done that before? Yeah, I've done that. I used to go jogging a lot and spraying things. Visual and analog scale, 0 to 10, how much does that hurt, do we think? When we do this with patients, most of them go for 8, 9, that looks really painful. Fair enough? Yeah, okay. Now put yourself in another situation. You're walking across that same road, but this time there's a double-decker bus bearing down on you. How much does that ankle hurt now? Yeah, the message here is double-decker buses hurt a hell of a lot more than a sprained ankle. Again, nociception is not enough to trigger off a pain response. We know that. There's a raft of evidence to show that. And so, come back to our definition here. Multiple system output, always an output, activated by the brain based on perceived threat. And now we start to see the link, how perception works. We can use this with patients to show this. It's important to make this link when you talk to them. <coughs> What's really important is education and communication really does reduce the threat output. And I want to go some way to proving that. FMRI studies prove this. FMRI studies show us brain activity. A really nice modern technique of showing us what's going on inside the brain. And if we look here, A is somebody who's got a lot of pain. They've got a central nervous system that's very active, probably had pain for a very long time. B is somebody who's got a brain that's far less active. And what's happened here? This is a before and after. Four weeks of pain education. Nothing fancy, no injections, nothing else. This is four weeks, this is what I do with patients, a four week course of understanding how this all works. It's quite interesting, because what this offers patients really is two things. Legitimization, it shows them there's a problem. There's something physical happening here. This isn't a made up, I'm mad it's in my head, which is the impression that some patients get through our communication. It's legitimized, it's there. And also it proves the fact to us and to patients that education and communication can make a significant change in how they perceive the world. 